or if we have some people joining late. Awesome. So hopefully you're out of lockdown wherever you are. Things are pretty much back to normal here in Bangkok. Uh, I hope you're able to go out to a restaurant and eat a nice meal with, with family and friends and loved ones. And um, well, I hope you survived lockdown and, and it'd be wonderful that you can take those learnings, whatever you learned during lockdown about yourself, about your reactions and your responses, about your emotional control, they are all massive, massive learnings that you can use to empower yourself in the future, whatever that is for you. Whether you are in a, a career transition at the moment, uh, if you're starting up your own business, if you're looking to expand your business, uh, I think we can all agree there are a lot of lessons uh, we can utilize from lockdown uh, to make us a better leader. And certainly from what I have experienced in the clients that I've been working with and the companies that I've been working with, um, uh, developing coaching skills for the leaders, you know, right the way from me middle management level all the way up, Developing those coaching skills has uh, proved very, very valuable for those proactive companies who've been able to navigate the uncertainty of lockdown. Um, and, and we live in such a uh, interesting time, shall we say. You know, the things that are happening in America right now and, and the UK and other parts of the world, like here we are in July, <laughs> What's going to happen this month? I don't know. One thing is for sure, though, the more tools and resources and strategies we have as individuals, it will help us deal with whatever July and the rest of 2020 is going to bring us. It's a, it's a cross between a, a Stephen King movie and a Quentin, sorry, a Stephen King book and a Quentin Tarantino movie 2020 at the moment. So let's see what the second half of the year brings. Um, uh, me and Christy and the team here at Coachology, we're actually very grateful for the first half of 2020. We've learned a lot. We've grown a lot. Uh, thankfully, we were quite agile and we're able to pivot our business. And thanks to you guys, um, running these free webinars every week was a, a huge, huge thing for us. When I did the first one back in, I think it was late March, uh, it was my first time doing a public webinar. And uh, wow, be, because of that experience, we were able to provide um, you know, ongoing corporate webinars for our clients, as well as our online ICF coaching program, all of which would not have been done if we weren't forced into this lockdown process. So I really thank everyone for your encouragement for joining us here uh, today again. And let's, uh, let's get started, shall we? So that's today's topic is, is really about how we can implement a coaching culture. Whether you're a very small business with two or three employees, uh, whether you're a small to medium business or a large multinational organization, or if you're coaching and training for organizations like that, then um, we're going to discover a step-by-step -step process on how you can implement a coaching culture. Now, it's a little bit too much content to get through in one hour. So I've split it over part one and part two today and of course, next Wednesday. Cool. So as you know, guys, uh, we're going to use the chat box again today. Uh, for those that are joining us for the first time, uh, we have a YouTube channel so you can catch all of the previous webinars that we've done all through the lockdown period. I, I think there's about 13 or 14 uh, webinars recorded in the chat box there. Now you can see the link for that. And if your time is a little bit tighter, then you can join our 60 second leadership group. Both of those links are in the chat box now. So without further ado, let's jump on all aboard. <laughs> So what are we going to cover today? The clear definition of what coaching is and why is it important. So there's still a bit of mysticism about what coaching actually is. And we're going to look at how to implement a coaching culture from the top down. There's actually two main ways to do it. We're going to cover one way this week and the second way next week. Uh, the leadership development matrix. How does it all come together with coaching and telling and mentoring and facilitating? 
uh, some simple and powerful effective coaching questions that you can start to ask today to begin to start coaching like right now, immediately. The typical resistance that you might experience to coaching, whether you're a leader, the business owner, or a professional coach, you are going to come up against resistance. And we've identified those main types of resistance. And then understanding and really knowing the key benefits to coaching your teams or to coaching individuals. When we clearly understand the benefits, that will help us overcome the resistance. So as I mentioned, we have our YouTube channel with 20 plus hours of previous webinars. The link is in the chat box. So is the link for the 60 second leadership, which is really cool little group. Uh, we're, we're building quickly. We have about 250 members now where we just share uh, little 60 second tips, videos, links, memes, uh, whatever on leadership development. Please join us there. So the first thing I wanna to touch on, which is so, so important, if you're looking to incorporate coaching as part of your leadership toolbox or as, as a professional coach. And that first thing is you want to be open-minded and curious like a child. And certainly for Christy and I, who between, a, between us have done more than 10,000 hours of one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, and we, we've certified hundreds uh, of coaches throughout Asia. In our experience, the best coaches, the ones that really get it and accelerate quickly, uh, are those ones that are curious and open-minded and almost childlike in their hunger to learn, All right? You know, those small humans, the, the, the children, yeah, those ones, you know how like they're just hungry to learn and they're, they're curious and they're kind of like a little bit playful. That's a really, really great quality uh, for a coach in, in, in whatever context you want to coach, coaching your teams, coaching your kids, coaching paid clients, coaching executives, it's all the same. And with that curiosity, you want a sense of humility as well. In other words, to be humble, right? The, the, the coaches that are kind of arrogant and think they know it all and, and kind of walk around like a peacock with their flashy feathers, in our experience, are not so effective, right? So please, as you're implementing these coaching tools, remind yourself to be always curious. And, and, and why is that important? Because your client is the expert in his or her life and in his or her problem or situation or event or whatever's going on. And as a coach, it's not our job to fix them. So if we think we know how to fix the problem, well, that is not going to enable or empower the client to solve the problem for themselves, right? So open-minded, curious, and humble is a great place to start. And the other one is you, as the coach, you must be willing to push yourself outside of your comfort zone. And the reason why this is so important is, guess what? Your client right? They're, they're coming to you as if they're a paid client, obviously, right? In that context, if they're paying you money for you to coach them, that generally means they want to achieve a goal in their life. And that could be overcoming a problem or a challenge, or it could be getting promoted or a new job or starting their business, whatever it is. Clearly, that is going to take a new version of themselves to achieve that goal. So that means they need to get outside of their comfort zone to continually grow, to evolve, to become that person where that challenge no longer exists or where they have achieved that goal that they're looking for. So if you want to support that space to enable your client to grow and push themselves outside of their comfort zone, then you must be willing to do the same as well in your coaching practice. Whether you're a paid coach or a leader who's using coaching tools, same, same, right? So in other words, how can we have empathy and support our client to push beyond those boundaries of their familiar, comfortable zone? How can we push them if we're not willing to do it ourselves? 
So those two qualities are really, really important for you to embody as a coach because it will dramatically accelerate the results that you'll be able to get for your clients. Make sense? Cool. Right, so let, let's jump straight in. I'm gonna show you here the process that Christy and I have kind of developed over the last 10 years on how to successfully implement a coaching culture. All right, so that big circle there, that's your organization and there's the coaching culture. And, and clearly you want the coaching culture to grow to be part of the entire organization. Remember, uh, an organization with three people, 300 or 3,000, same, same. Now, where we see the little blue arrows, that is where you'll need external support, such as a coach training provider, such as ourselves, or some other licensed certified coach or facilitator that's going to support the implementation. And then the purple arrow is going to be internal support, such as HR, learning and development, uh, the, the, the big boss, uh, people who are passionate about coaching. So this is what we call the top-down approach. We're going to learn one method to roll out the coaching, uh, coaching culture this week, and we're going to learn the other model next week. So with the top-down approach, as you could imagine, you start from the top down. So when we talk about the top of the organization, we mean the CEO, the MD, the GM, the business owner, the person at the top of the food chain. And they should be perceived to be receiving coaching from some kind of external executive coach. Right, it could be an executive coach, a life coach, a business coach, whatever you want to call it. The the big boss is, and they're not doing it behind closed doors, right? Yes, the conversation is happening nice and privately, but it's obvious that the CEO, the big boss, is willing to invest their time. Right? It's not really about money at this point, it's about the time because time is the most precious or limited resource that we have. So if the CEO is seen by the rest of the organization to be receiving coaching of some way, shape or form, then that sends a very, very positive message to the rest of the organization. It tells the organization, number one, that I'm not perfect, you know, as the big boss, I'm not perfect, I have room to grow. It shows that my personal and professional development is important. It shows that no matter how senior I am, there's always stuff that I don't know that I don't know. And by engaging with a coach, I'm able to identify some of those blind spots or work on improving specific behaviors. It also shows that I'm willing to walk the talk, right? Imagine you've got some big boss who's not getting coached and they say, okay, guys, I want you to implement a coaching culture. Off you go. Go, go and do that. I'm just going to do this over here. Sorry, that, <laughs> that will die before it even starts. So this is one of the most powerful ways uh, to implement a coaching culture. Now, if you are the business owner or the CEO or MD, then this is really, really easy for you, right? This step is really, really easy. In a, in a multinational company, it might be a little bit more challenging, but let's go through the rest of the steps first and take a look. Now, as the CEO or the big boss is perceived to be receiving some form of coaching, the HR, the L&D team want to begin to communicate and educate the benefits of coaching. And those benefits we're going to cover in a moment. Um, but for sure, they want to start putting up some posters, they want to start putting out some flyers, perhaps some, uh, some links to some videos to educate the rest of the organisation what coaching is all about. Because as we'll realise in a moment, one of the biggest resistances to coaching is a lack of awareness about what coaching is. So... The HR, the L&D team, whoever's driving this project forward must 
clearly communicate the benefits of coaching. And this can happen at the same time as the coach, uh, as, sorry, as the CEO is receiving his or her coaching. Now, a magical thing happens. When the big boss is receiving some form of coaching, ultimately, that leader gets better at delegation. They also get better at mentoring. And in fact, if they truly want to create a coaching culture, which by the way, if they've invested in coaching, then chances are that is something that they are interested in, then it's in their best interest that not only do they you know, receive the coaching, but they get better at delegation, they get better at mentoring, and then of course, they get better at coaching as well. So again, right now they're, they're walking the talk, right? And as they begin to, from the tools and, and everything that they learn from their coach, then they're able to implement some of those same practices with their subordinates, with their teams, with their direct reports. And that really shows a congruency from the top down. Right, then we want to be able to create raving fans with training. So re remember, at this level where we are right now, chances are most people in the organisation still don't know much about coaching. And for sure, most of them have probably never ever attended some kind of coach training program where they learn uh, coaching tools and techniques, some advanced communication, uh, leadership tools, all of which will help them to begin to utilize coaching principles in their role as a leader. So what we recommend and what works very, very well is you get some of the senior management team, usually a group of 20 or 30 works best, and then they attend a customized in-house coaching excellence program where they learn some best practices of how to coach their subordinates, especially in the context of leadership and organizational coaching. Now, can you apply those same skills out in the real world with life coaching and coaching your kids and other family members? Of course, absolutely. These same tools apply everywhere, right? So, what happens is when someone like me or Christy or another coach training provider, when we come in for two days, people get excited. People, for the first time, truly understand the, the benefits of coaching. And as they go through the practice sessions, and there's a lot of practice sessions, by the way, they're able to physically see the results after a 10 or 15 minute coaching conversation. So guess what? When you have a room of 20 or 30 people who are breaking through, who are removing negative emotion from that event that happened years ago, who can articulate a clear action plan, solve current problems, when you've got a room full of people breaking through, then they become what we call raving fans. And of course, they are going to go back into the organization. Now we're back to internal, right? They're taking the tools that they learned during those two days and then now they are coaching their teams, right? Their subordinates, uh, their peers, uh, and then so on. Make sense? Now, another way to support the implementation is in addition to the big boss, if it's a larger organization, you may have two or three of the other executives, right, in the, in the kind of the higher level, they might receive some external coaching as well. Now, what happens then is they become a raving fan of the coaching process as well. So now it's all starting to happen from the inside. Now, as you go through time, you, as, a, as an organization, you won't want to pay an external provider to do all of the coaching all of the time. So at some point, you will want to certify some of your internal people, such as HR, learning and development, 
certain directors, people that are passionate about coaching, people that are passionate to help other people. It might even be the business owner or the MD. We have many senior executives and business owners coming to our coaching programs. So what happens here is they get certified. They are officially an internationally certified coach, just like Christy and I, and then they can then go back into their organization and then they can coach more effectively. They can coach more people more effectively. And can you imagine if you get five or 10 people certified inside of your organization, then that is clearly going to accelerate the whole process of the implementation of the coaching culture. Does that make sense, guys? Yes? Any questions? Just let me know if I have any questions there, please, uh, Coach Christie. Uh, any hard data to prove the benefits of coaching, to prove leaders that it is a crucial part of the role? Great question, Elizabeth. Yes, it does exist. There is data. Uh, one of the best places to start to look for that specific data is the uh, ICF website. So the ICF is the International Coach Federation. It's the world's largest coaching authority. If you go to their website, international coach, no, coachfederation.com or .org, I think, they have some, uh, some data, some studies, case studies, percentages, and all of that kind of hard physical data. But there's a bunch of information out there. Yes. 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 Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, very good question. Another great question from Elizabeth. Thank you. So let me just read that question out loud. Does that mean that not all leaders can be good coaches due to their personality and interest? Absolutely. Not everyone can be a good coach. Um, now, having said that, can they do uh, okay coaching and, and be a better leader? Yes, they can. Uh, is it going to be their life calling? Uh, probably not. So as we're going to learn a few little tips today, there are some really, really simple and effective coaching principles that we can apply, even for those <laughs> bad leaders, uh, where even with a few simple coaching principles can help them to make a better leader. And it's probably a good point to mention, um, coaching is a tool that is used sometimes. We, as a leader, we don't use coaching all the time for all people in all situations. So just be mindful there that coaching is just used, you know, uh, at, at certain times, right? So I hope that answers that question. Help, should we have independent coaches in the organization? Independent coaches, Elizabeth, in the beginning to get the ball rolling. Now, I mean, coaches like me, we'd be happy to stay around for the next three to five years if you keep wanting to pay us, right? But I'm, I'm a realist and I know that I want my clients to get the best ROI possible. And how to do that? We come in at the beginning, we help get it set up, we certify some of your key people, and then we have the need to come in less and less and less. Does that make sense, right? So some of those uh, teams... We, we coach them for the two-day uh, coaching program, which gives them communication skills and coaching tools. But our expectation is that you can do it yourselves. That's our goal when we partner with some of these big organizations. Yes, we come in for a year or so, and then we come in less, maybe then uh, three times a year, twice a year, once a year, perfect. And that's just to maintain with that, for that can I, that constant and never ending improvement. Yes. To believe in coaching. Okay. So how to influence someone. We're going to come to that in a minute when we focus on the benefits, guys. Remember, you can't just kind of tell them directly. You need to influence them. And, um, well, one way here is to create some raving fans, right? So if you have one or two people that get coached, from an external coach and they have a good experience, which, which is what you would want, then guess what? They're going to tell their friends, wow, uh, I had this coach, Mary, she was awesome. She coached me, I, I got real clear on my goals. She helped me overcome this problem. Wow, this coaching process is cool. 
engaged. This is what we mean by creating a raving fan. So sometimes communicating directly to the boss may not be the most effective. Be the change that you want to see in the world, right? If you receive coaching and then you improve, your boss will say, well, you've performed really good this last month. You're, you're, you're ahead of your target, your teamwork. And I, I feel the energy and the synergy in the room. What are you doing? And you say, boss, I'm glad you asked. It's called coaching. Would you like to learn more? Right? So it's through being that change that you want to see is how you begin to influence the world around you. Will it take a bit of time? Yeah. Is it worth it? Absolutely. Uh, a couple more questions. I've got it here. As a facilitator of learning how we can apply coaching culture in a classroom setting. Yeah, classroom setting, mm, let's come back to that at the end if we still have time. Well, let's focus on leadership for today because we've only got an hour. Uh, again, though, yeah, you, you're going to get the answer to that in a moment. Let's keep moving, guys. Um, so here are just some of the clients who are using coaching principles methodology. We've done trainings with all of these companies who are using uh, coaching and or NLP, NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. Some of them have done many, many programs. Some of them have done, you know, shorter one or two day programs. So rest assured that all of these companies all throughout Asia, by the way, uh, they are investing in coaching at the moment. They are investing to train their leaders on how to utilize coaching tools and techniques. For example, this company here is uh, Siam City Cement. Uh, it's a very large publicly listed company here in Thailand. Uh, late last year, we did an in-house NLP training, which is a five day training. Uh, followed by some online group coaching, uh, as along, along with some project implementation. And Christy and I supported that whole process over the six month period. Their brief to us was they want to implement a coaching culture. So their strategy was to send 30 three zero people uh, to have them certified as NLP coaches. And the results were absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. So this is the program that they chose. They chose the NLP Leadership Certification Program, which is a four-in-one certification. They got four international certificates. Part of their process was like, how do we support them to actually implement the tools when we're not there? Well, that happened through the group coaching, it happened through the project implementation. So we split them into some subgroups where they had to implement a specific project and they had to log 10 hours of actual coaching experience where they were coaching their direct subordinates. And so we facilitated this for them as a customized in-house program with the focus to implement the coaching culture. It's also uh, available as a public program, which, hello, it's starting next week. So only if you're in Thailand, uh, sorry, if you're in Malaysia or Singapore, Philippines or Dubai, uh, you'll have to wait to the November session. But if you're in Thailand, come and join us next week from the 9th to the 13th of July. Now, a lot of people are asking, oh, you know, what about lockdown? We can't do any coaching. Oh my goodness. So, so, so not true. So SCC, the company that I just mentioned just now, now those 30 individuals inside uh, that have been certified as NLP coaches, they've now completed more than 20 hours each of coaching with their subordinates and their project leaders. And so what that means is, if a professional coach, by the way, can charge 3,000 baht per hour or, or $100 per hour, 100 Sing, 100 US, 100 Aussie dollar, pick, pick a currency, about that amount. So guess what? By 30 people conducting 20 hours of coaching, right, then at the value of 3,000 baht per hour, that is a value of 2 million baht. 
And this is why I say that certifying internal coaches is the best ROI that you can get because they would have had to pay more than 2 million baht to hire coaches like Christy or I to get those hours of coaching done. But by doing it internally, this is the long-term best ROI that your organization can get. Griffith Foods, they wanted some kind of more positive thinking mindset coaching that we conducted through the middle of lockdown. So once per week for five weeks in a row in Thai language, Coach Christie was able to coach and mentor and motivate their teams using some of these NLP coaching principles. Then we had Maxis in Malaysia. They are the equivalent of AIS here in Thailand, a telecommunications company. They engaged us for five webinars on how to virtually lead and coach teams. So what I want you to understand here, guys, these companies are very, very proactive. As soon as we went into lockdown, they began to look for tools, resources, strategies, and techniques to support their teams navigate the uncertainty of lockdown. So it was spread out over, I think, a, a, an eight-week period. Uh, I facilitated five sessions to help their leaders coach and lead virtually, just like we're doing right now. And they were so happy with that program. We're running another program this month, uh, exactly the same program with a new group of 50 leaders. And then finally, Michelin. They wanted to implement uh, the leadership, empowered leadership workshop, which has a lot of leadership and coaching tools. We also facilitated that virtually. Because these organizations, and this is what I want you to get, these organizations, they did not wait until things went back to normal so that we could conduct the training inside a normal hotel. Because I don't know when we can travel. <laughs> September, October, maybe. So during these high levels of uncertainty, it's a leader's job to create certainty. So these proactive companies engaged with us to give them those additional tools and resources. So please rest assured that there are many, many organizations who are investing in coaching tools, techniques, and strategies to support their leadership development. So wherever you are on your leadership journey, having coaching tools are going to help you, guaranteed. Cool. Now, a lot of people ask, what's the difference between NLP coaching and ICF coaching? So let's clarify that really, really quickly. Here's your client in the present moment. That's the future. This is where ICF coaching works the best, from the present moment into the future. In fact, with the ICF code of ethics, an ICF coach cannot coach someone in the past. And what do I mean in the past? if they have some traumatic event or some heavy negative emotion or some other significant event that happened in the past, the ICF coach is not certified to go into those deeper areas. So the ICF is internationally accredited, it's the growth coaching framework, improve leadership through empowerment. You discover a full coaching process, systems and framework, which is perfect for leadership coaching. It supports you to create a coaching culture and get paid as a professional coach, either full-time or as a part-time process. Now, I know that you know that everyone has a past. So what about those challenges, those limitations, those blockages, those mindsets, those programs that hold us back from the past? Well, that's where NLP comes in. Now, in addition to helping in the past, NLP also has a many set of tools to help people into the future as well. So the NLP, there's four certificates. NLP is good for your personal development, right? So your internal communication, thoughts, emotions, decisions, your external communication, uh, here we're talking about influence, coming back to that question before, Elizabeth, on how do we influence the world around us? Well, NLP helps a lot. Uh, develop all of your soft skills with NLP. 
great for strategic thinking and decision making, awesome for EQ and developing empathy, and there are some advanced leadership and coaching skills. And so that's quickly to identify and clarify the differences there. So I see a couple of, okay, Christy answered some of those questions, great. Okay, so let's moving on. So <laughs> we've talked a bit about coaching now for maybe half an hour already. Uh, what is it? <laughs> Would be good to be clear on the definition, right? So coaching is partnering with clients in a thought provoking and creative process that inspires them to maximize their personal and professional potential. So what we mean here is, and by the way, this is the, uh, the official ICF, International Coach Federation definition of coaching. So there's a couple of key words in there, partnering, right? Coaching is a partnership. It's a co-creation. It's thought provoking. It's creative, right? You, you must support your client whether that's your team member, to think differently. Because if they think the same, they will achieve the same. So as you support them to think creatively and think differently, then they're going to come up with new actions which lead to new results. Now, I like to keep things as simple as I can. Uh, my definition of coaching is really about asking and listening, not telling people what to do. So if you want a coaching 101 definition, this is it. In coaching, when you've got your coaching hat on, which remember you don't wear all of the time, you wear it sometimes in your leadership role. Uh, as a coach, when you have that coach hat on, we never, ever, never, ever, ever, never, ever, never tell your client what to do. Never. We just don't. And you will need to resist that urge to tell your subordinates or your clients or whoever you're having that coaching conversation with, you will need to resist that urge to tell them how to fix their problems. We don't do that. Instead, you want to ask questions that evoke those thought provoking creative ideas so the client can come up with their own solutions. Why? Why is that important? Well, as they're coming up with their own solutions, they're more empowered. They take more ownership. They're going to follow through and drive it forward. And you've helped them to think in new creative ways. As you do that more, well, they will get more creative and more resourceful to solve even bigger problems in the future. So here is a list of some simple and powerful coaching questions which by the way, uh, I know we've already got some existing coaches on the call here today, which is awesome. And I know some of the leaders on the call are already using some coaching principles. So in the chat box, please share your favorite simple coaching questions, please. Go ahead and drop those into the chat box now. And let's take a look. So your staff is gonna come to you with a problem. And you're not going to tell them what to do because that's not coaching. So you're going to ask them, what do you think, right? Don't tell them. You, you, if you're so good, if you have the habit or the program of telling them what to do, you will need to bite your tongue. And you will need to gently ask, patiently ask some of these questions. What do you think? What could be a possible solution? What could be one option, right? And then in the beginning, they'll say, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Or they'll come up with an option and maybe that option is not so good. Then you say, great. Or well, what could be another option, right? So remember, as, as a coach, you're curious, you're humble, you're patient, right? You don't, do, you don't ask these questions if the building is on fire, right? You, you, you make sure you have the time. It's an investment in your time to have these questions. And it's a worthwhile investment of your time, which we'll come to in a moment. What else, right? So what are some of your favorite questions, guys? What alternatives do we have? Any suggestions? Yeah, could you try this option? Now, this what else is a question for you, but guess what? This what else is also a question for your client. What else, what else, 
what else? It's one of my favorite questions, right? Whenever they give you the first answer, don't settle for the first answer. Dig a little deeper, get beyond the surface level, get them to really think about the solution. So what else, what else, what else is awesome? Now, when they do say to you, oh boss, I don't know, just tell me, you've, you've told me for the last 10 years, just tell me. So you can patiently say, well, I know you don't know, but if you did know, what could be one possible solution? What would your role model recommend? What if it were easy? That's a great question, so powerful. What would I recommend you to do, right? If, if you were me, what would I tell you to do to solve that thing? Now, by the way, coming back to the question before about how can you implement it in a classroom, right here, right? You don't need the full-blown coaching structure process yet. You just want to get in the habit of flipping the problem around the situation to empower the kids to come up with their own solution. Take a photo in the minute when we pull up all of this screen or watch the recording on YouTube later tonight. What's missing? Mm. What's the very next physical action? This is one of my favorites. I mean, I think they're all my favorites, but this is one especially is one of my favorites. Why? Because it gets people unstuck. It gets people beyond procrastination. It helps people o overcome overwhelm when you just focus on the very next physical action. Cool. Right. The leadership. Oh, by the way, do we have some cool questions here? Yeah, not to expect the answer from the coach. Shall we set the rules at the beginning? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, it's yes, if, if you especially if you're a paid coach, right, if you're getting paid for your coaching services, and your client is expecting you to tell them answers, well, that's something else. We call that consulting. So you need to be very, very clear at the beginning of the coaching engagement that, that they understand what coaching is and what coaching is not. Yeah? Yes, please, Christy. Yes. Yes. Find a new boss. <laughs> no, uh, I don't. Okay, let me let me read that question again. When I ask questions to my boss, he stopped me asking question as he has no answer to me. How to handle situation like this? Yeah, uh, <laughs> find a new boss. Um, yeah, so. I, I don't know the exact context of, of what that question entails, that there could be many different reasons why. It could be that that boss does not know. He doesn't know the answer to your question. And he might, he or she might be afraid of losing face or whatever reason, so he just tells you to stop and go away because he, doesn't, he or she doesn't want to feel stupid, right? Now, that's one possible uh, assumption but there could be multiple assumptions going on. Um, what I would suggest though, is you can say, well, well boss, I, I need some answers to this thing, please. Is there someone that I can speak to who can help me answer these questions? Yeah, something like that. Anyway, keep on moving. So this is the leadership development matrix, where on one side we have the problem and then the solution. And then down the bottom, we have telling, and at the top, we have asking. So most leaders out there in the world at the moment spend their time in this quadrant here. Now, I did share this slide about three months ago, and I think some of you probably remember it, and I think some of you may not remember it. How, what percentage of the time are most leaders out there in the world spending in this bottom left-hand quadrant? Are they down here 50% of the time, 60% of the time, 95% of the time? Pop your answers into the chat box now quickly, guys. How many percentage of the time are leaders spending in this problem and telling quadrant? What do you think? 
Anyone? Anyone? Ninety, seventy, eighty, fifty. Yep, eighty percent. Most leaders in the world at the moment are spending eighty percent of the time in this quadrant. Now, the problem with that is when we're focused on that area, when we're focused on that area, we're telling people what to do, we're blaming people, we're complaining, we're demanding, and all of those kind of ugly qualities of leadership. So my invitation to you would be, don't be that kind of leader. Now, as I mentioned before, coaching is a tool that you use sometimes with some of the people, right? We don't coach 100% of the people 100% of the time. We can't do that. So we do need to tell people what to do sometimes, and that's okay. Now, there might be a facilitation process where you kind of identify the problem and then you're asking questions. So when Christy or I are invited into an organization, oftentimes we're doing a lot of facilitating to help them to solve the problem. But guess what? They're the expert in their business. So our job is to help them to be more creative to come up with new solutions. And so that's what we do when we go in to facilitate with an organization. But guess what? You need to mentor as well. An effective leader must mentor. And in fact, if you truly want to successfully implement a coaching culture, it's not just coaching. It's going to be all four quadrants in this leadership development matrix. So mentoring is, yes, you're telling them what to do, but you're focusing more on the solution. For example, uh, here you are very, very experienced in the company. You've been there 10 years. You've got someone new join the company. Well, that's perhaps not the time to coach them and ask them, what do you think? Because they don't know. They've just joined the company. So you will train them. You will mentor them. You will tell them some things what to do to accelerate their development. Then finally, you'll get to coaching. And remember, coaching, we don't tell people what to do and we definitely don't focus on the problem, right? We'll spend a, a, a short amount of time identifying what a problem or challenge might be and then as quickly as possible, we're focusing on the solution. So again, get ready to write your answers. Most leaders out there in the world right now are coaching how many percentage of their time? So they have 100% of time during their working week out of that 100%, what percentage of the time are they coaching at the moment? Most people out there in the world, guys, how many? <laughs> Mine, zero. Zero, 10, less than 20, 20, maybe 30, five. Great answers. 1%, guys. Mo on average, most leaders out there, they still don't know what coaching is. You, you talk about coaching and they talk about Manchester United or Liverpool. <laughs> well, they talk about the Michael Jordan series on Netflix right now. Uh, they're not talking about leadership coaching. They're not talking about coaching to empower their teams. So my invitation to you is even as little as 10% of your time coaching your subordinates is going to make a huge difference, huge difference. Now, and this of course depends on the size of your team, your industry, your role within the organization. I get it, there's very flexible here. Anywhere between 10 and 20% is awesome. If you are implementing coaching principles, 10 to 20% of your day, right, or, or spread out over the week on average, you're going to get amazing, amazing results with your team. And guess what? The big bosses are going to notice that. They're going to notice that you are doing something different. Now, if you increase your level of coaching and if you increase your level of mentoring, your staff are going to love you. Why? because you're empowering them. You're challenging them a little bit. You're nudging them to the edge of their comfort zone. But guess what? Deep down, people want that. That's why we came into this existence was to grow and evolve and become a better version of ourselves. Does that make sense, guys? Yes? Cool. 
Uh, excellent. So, sorry, one quick question. Meaning that using either coaching or mentoring will depend on the development level of the client. Exactly. Think of situational leadership. It's a leadership model from a few years back or quite a few years back. Depending on the situation, depending on your level and depending on the level of your subordinate, you will use different tools or techniques. Sometimes you do need to tell them or you need to put them into a training program or you need to mentor them. And rest assured, no one is coaching at the moment, hardly. So when you start... <laughs> implementing and utilizing coaching principles you're going to have a huge success with your subordinates so this is the typical resistance to coaching a lack of awareness to what coaching is and all the benefits of coaching so it is changing slowly there are more people who are more aware of the benefits of coaching and you only need to look at those, uh, those page of clients that I showed you before to know that those clients are investing in coaching at the moment. So if you are a trainer or a coach, it's a good time to be in the business, right? Because there are companies willing to pay for it. And if you wanna at some point get promoted or move to a larger organization with larger responsibility and therefore a larger salary package, then coaching skills are going to help you to get to that level. But one thing is for sure, it's up to us. All, how many on the call right now? It's up to all 57 of us to educate people of the benefits of coaching. It's to help them become aware of what coaching is. And as we do so, well, then there'll be a greater acceptance of coaching and then you'll be able to easily measure your returns on investment. But it starts with us, right? So if you, if you want to create that coaching culture, you may want to consider to be the change you want to see in the world, right? So we're about to cover the benefits of coaching in a moment. Understanding the benefits of coaching will help us to overcome the resistance to coaching. Next. If I need coaching, there must be something wrong with me. So oftentimes in organisations, the way that that message is delivered to the employee that they need coaching, it's often delivered in a non-productive way, shall we say. It's delivered in a way that is not empowering. So for example, it might sound something like this. Okay, so here I am, I'm HR or L&D, or I'm the, the, the boss, and I say, uh, John, uh, your performance this last quarter was, was not so good. So I've arranged a coach, and the coach is gonna come in tomorrow, and I want you to meet the coach at one o'clock, because we just gotta fix this, John. It's just, it's not acceptable. Okay, so be there tomorrow at one o'clock. The coach is going to fix you. Okay, great. How do you think that conversation would go? Is John going to be motivated? Yes or no? Absolutely not. So the poor coach, here's John, right, who is already demoralized, demotivated, not interested in coaching whatsoever. Here comes Fred. Fred could be the best coach in the world. It ain't going to happen because coaching is a partnership. So if you are in that position where you need to inform someone that they're going to experience coaching, it might sound something like this. Bill, I see potential in you and I know that there's an opportunity to continue to grow your performance. And in my experience, coaching is a very effective process to help you grow within the organization. Is this something you would like to experience? Most likely Bill will go, uh-huh. So then you would follow through and say, well, tomorrow at one o'clock, I've arranged a professional coach to come in and to speak with you and i want you to get to know each other and i want you to share with the coach what areas that you would like to improve 
right? And we, we know about your performance these last three months and there are some opportunity areas there for sure. And this is an opportunity for you to grow within the organization. So if you meet and you feel there's a good chemistry and it's something you'd like to explore, I'm willing to invest in you with this coaching to grow within the organization. Is that something that you'd be interested in? Right, for sure. So now, Coach Fred turns up, what do we call him, Bill? <laughs> He's raring to go, he can't wait to be coached. So if you are that leader or HR or L&D or big boss and you're having that conversation with your team, please choose option two in the little role play I've just done just now. The next biggest resistance, ego. That's a little bit too much to unpack right now. Uh, I am gonna post a video on YouTube about ego tomorrow. Watch the video tomorrow. They may have had a bad experience with a less experienced coach, right? So what does that mean is, you know, the employee may have experienced coaching once before, but that coaching conversation was kind of a train wreck or perhaps that coach was not qualified or experienced enough. Maybe there was just no chemistry and it did not work. So that bad experience may influence the present moment. So it's really good to know if they have had an experience before. And then finally, we don't have enough time to coach, right? So that's the main resistance you are going to experience as a coach, whether you're a leadership coach coaching your teams or you're out there as a professional coach. These are the main ones that Chrissy and I have experienced in our coaching careers. Now, I believe there's some questions here. As an NLP coach, can we coach for the future is issue? Yes, Dr. Gunnar. Uh, NLP coaching works on the past to remove those ne ne negative emotions, limiting belief, negative thinking. And you can absolutely do goal setting. You can do visioning. You can do uh, language patterns and you can do all sorts of things to help your client into the future. So the answer is ICF for the present moment to the future, NLP for the past and for the future. Now together, ICF and NLP, unstoppable, unstoppable. You can coach anyone who walks through your door. You have the tools and resources to do so. All you need is the certification, and then the experience to be able to coach anyone, anytime, anywhere. Um, thank you, Christy. Yeah, if he's not interested or reluctant, yeah, that's where ego comes in. So guess what? Remember I said you can't coach everyone all of the time. So watch this video on YouTube tomorrow, not this video, the, another video I'm posting tomorrow. Guess what? If they're fully resistant, don't coach them. Use another tool, right? Remember, coaching is one tool in your leadership toolkit. If they're resistant or they just, you know, they're acting like a little child, then you will need to use a different leadership technique, such as giving direct feedback, such as giving disciplinary action as two examples, right? So just know, remember, coaching is a partnership, right? Cool, moving on. So what are some of the benefits of coaching? The biggest one, coaching is a return on investment of your time. As we talk about time, how are we doing? Oh my goodness. <laughs> awesome. So let me wrap up this guys. I'm gonna go over for about five minutes here and then we're gonna come back next week and we're gonna pick up here where we left off. So please join us next week as well. Let me cover this point though first, it's so, so important. You know, if, uh, if you were to give me $1,000 and I gave you back $5,000, is that a good return on investment? Yes or yes? Of course it is. I want you to think of coaching as the same concept, but with time, right? You are investing time to coach your subordinates. You, you know, asking them those questions. What do you think? What could be one option? What's a possible solution? I know you don't know, but if you did know, what's the very next physical actions? Any of those questions take time. But guess what? 
When you do that with consistency, after two or three, maybe four times, that subordinate, he thinks, oh, if I go to Luke, he's just going to ask me, oh, what do you think I should do? So you know what? I'm going to solve the problem myself. Boom. You have now empowered that employee, that subordinate, to think for themselves, to solve their own problems. And is that going to save you time in the long run? Absolutely. So your investment of 20 minutes here is going to save you an hour here, two hours there, three hours in the long run. And guess what? When you do that with everyone in your team, then you're going to get a huge return on investment of your time. Make sense? So that's why you can start practicing your coaching today, guys. And in fact, that's my invitation for you today. Between now and next week, those lists of simple coaching questions, I want you to move from that bottom quadrant up into that top right quadrant. Stop telling your teams what to do or your students or whoever it is, your clients, and simply begin by asking more questions. And then I want you to share your results next week. Okay? So, and then we'll pick up right from here uh, next week, guys. Uh, just very quickly, I'm gonna, we're going to cover all this next week. I just want to quickly remind you, this is your last chance. This week, we have our ICF Leadership Coaching online, fully online program, 18 to 19 of July. You can be anywhere in the world. Please do join us. I'll email you some details on that later this afternoon. Thank you very much, everyone. That is the quickest hour of my life. Uh, as you can see, I'm passionate about coaching and I know that you are passionate about coaching. That's why you're on the call today. Please join us for part two next week. Bye everyone. Thank you. Take care.